Uh, today, two speakers from uh, Slack that we all love and use, Max and John. Uh, they both are on the red team, product security team, and they're going to share their knowledge about how to gamify security programs with CTFs. Take it away, guys. Cool. So welcome, everyone. Um, quick intros. I'm Max Feldman. I'm on the product security team at Slack. I run our bug bounty, so if you've submitted to that, you may have interacted with me, work on some of our feature reviews and reviews of applications on our app directory. Uh, and I'm John Sonnenschein. Uh, I run our infrastructure red team at Slack um, and everything that entails. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, set some context with the SDL process that we use at Slack, a bit about security education, uh, CTFs, capture the flags in general, and then uh, how we integrated CTFs into our security education. Um, so then the planning, the CTF we actually ran, the flags we used, uh, the execution of that, what went well, what didn't go quite so well and the lessons learned and some future plans of, uh, of what we have for our security education. So um, a bit about our security development life cycle. So we have a CI CD pipeline. Uh, it's very easy to develop and deploy. We have people coding on day one. Uh, it takes about 10 minutes to push something to production and new hires push to production within the first week. So we have um, a very, fast approach and like a kind of hit the ground running type of uh, setup for our new hires and the employees that we bring in. And we have about 100 deploys to production per day. And so uh, if you happen to catch Clint's talk yesterday, he mentioned our SDL process a little bit and the tool that we open source, but we have a thing that we called Go SDL, and that's a tool that we use as kind of a self-service checklist so that our developers and people working on our features can um, can work through security, can engage the security team and think about security concerns for their features and help us scale our team. So it offers self-service checklists um, that allow people to think through step by step, like what is this feature going to affect? Um, what security concerns may be present? How do we need to deal with that? Um, and that integrates into our whole culture of trusting our developments, uh, our developers. So at Slack we have a big culture of, of uh, limited blockers to, to developing, like being able to work quickly, but also a high degree of trust in our developers, in the people that are building our products and building our features. We want to have a good relationship, not an adversarial relationship, but something where we both help each other. Um, and so that brings me to security education. So for a lot of, we have a lot of passionate developers and people in general in the company. So uh, in our marketing, sales, all of our non-technical people, ops, uh, everything, um, people care about security. They care about what they're working on. They're very passionate, but people aren't always security experts. The security team has the security experts and uh, everyone else has varying levels of, of experience with security. Um, slideshows, text, books, et cetera, can be informative, but uh, doing a security training for people that doesn't have an engaging aspect is by its nature not very exciting. It's uh, if you sit through an hour of security slides, it's not super exciting. Even if you work in security, not, uh, not the most fun thing to look at 10 slides of what is XSS, 10 slides of what is CSERF, here's what it is in theory, to try not to do it. Um, we have front end, we have back end employees, a lot of different people from different backgrounds. We have people on the team who've worked on security teams before and then transitioned to development. There are people who are developers but dabble in security or they've, maybe they've been to Black Hat or maybe they've been to DEF CON. Um, and we also have a goal with our education of getting people in the company to work together. So not having so many silos of the company or having people work in isolation, but whenever we do training and education, we want to bring people in the company together. So have people who work in development interact with uh, people in sales, for example, or customer support, or have different teams and different people interact in uh, and grow together. So um, additionally, training, classes, et cetera, can be kind of overkill. So is it worth spending several thousand dollars to send a developer to like black hat trainings. Eh, 
Maybe, maybe not. Um, security conferences may not be relevant to the area, their areas of interest or what they're working on. They're also full of degenerates. Um, so the big question is, can we improve our education techniques? The answer is yes, and John is going to talk a little bit about CTFs. Right, so CTFs, uh, I enjoy them. Uh, some history of, the C uh, of CTFs. Um, they were started at DEF CON 4 um, in a sort of formalized way, um, and they kind of grew in popularity from there. There was, there was not super formalized. The challenges were just kind of made up by goons. Um, of varying levels of, of scoring, just whatever the goons kind of felt like. Um, and at, at, over time, they started to get more and more uh, formalized to the point where they are now, where there's you know different categories and different scoring uh, rubrics that you can use, um, more automated platforms that, use, uh, that, that um, are used to present them. Um, and I don't know if anybody in here plays CTS regularly, but there's, there's two main sort of general types is the Jeopardy style and then the attack defense style. So um, the Jeopardy style uh, is there's a bunch of questions, or there's a bunch of uh, challenges, you solve them, you get a flag, you put it in, you get points. The attack defense is you also are running the challenges on your own machines and you have to find the vulnerability, patch them so that other members, or so that other teams can't come in and, and take your flags. Um, they are super, super common. Um, Almost every uh, security conference has one these days. Uh, there's a bunch that just run online. Um, so there, we're at the point now where there's almost never a weekend where you can't just go do a CTF. Um, so if you want to do a CTF, you go to CTF time. Like if you have some extra time, you want to do a CTF, you go on CTF time, see what's running, and just pick one. Um, so yeah, so DEF CON 4 uh, was the first formal CTF. It was the first like official challenge. Um, contestants provided, and then ha uh, sorry, they provided machines, hacked others. Points were judged based on the coolest hacks. Um, it was sort of there wasn't a like a scoring rubric for it. There was just that was cool, so you get a hundred points kind of deal. Um, these days, they're organized by various groups. Usually, they end up being the teams that kind of won previous CTF. So, Plaid, the legit business syndicate, uh, are all very large CTF teams that will get together and, and compete for, you know, DEF CON qual uh, for, for the uh, official DEF CON CTFs, um, and they will in turn go and create challenges for other CTF players to do. Um, and, you know, they're, they're at every conference, um, including some that are specifically for training, such as the SANS Net Wars, which is a CTF specifically designed to train you to do things. Um, some cool stuff that, uh, just to show the sort of evolution of where we've come to in CTFs, other than just being like random things that you hack. Um, some recent stuff, uh, the DEF CON 24 had a, the Cyber Grand Challenge, which was a uh, completely automated AI CTF. So rather than you are presented with a problem and then must come up with a solution, you had to write a AI solver that could deal with this, with the problems that came up with it. Last year's DEF CON, uh, no, so the years before that, uh, DEF CON had the most just bat shit crazy um, uh, CTF machine to run on. It was a middle endian nine byte machine. So all of the previous tools that people had come up with for, for, C for playing CTFs before didn't work anymore because no other machine is middle endian. No other machine has nine bytes, but, or, sorry, nine bit bytes. Um, and interestingly, as soon as that was announced, that was announced 24 hours before that CTF was run. Um, by the time the CTF started, all of the tools had already been ported. So all of, the, all of the really good teams managed to modify the tools to deal with this just bonkers machine that has never existed in history, would never in exist in history because it's like, why would you ever use that? Um, so what are the, some of the pros and cons of running a CTF? Um, for uh, education, um, they're great puzzles. They're just fun to play. Um, they're very engaging. If you are at the least bit technically interested, um, they just, you know, no other time in your career will you get to solve middle endian nine bit byte uh, oh, buffer overflows. Um, they offer great rewards and incentives. Again, they're fun. At the end, there's prizes usually. Um, you can use a lot of memes in the names of the challenges. Um, 
And a lot of the platforms for running CTFs have evolved. Um, so CTFD is, the, is a common one. Uh, Facebook CTF is pretty cool. You get like a map and there's you know, animations that you can click through. Um, some of the cons are uh, of running a CTF or like inviting your coworkers to come play a CTF. Uh, they're not always work appropriate. Um, there's Blaze CTF, which is a weed themed CTF, which I don't think that you could get away with in most corporate environments. Um, and they're often tailored to a different level of security skills. So um, if you play CTFs a lot and you go on CTF time and pick a random one, you can have a good time. The challenges will be challenging. If you have never played one before and you go to go play like Plaid CTF, um, it will, you will not even know where to start. Um, so we ran a CTF uh, and we needed to plan it. So, uh, we, we started by thinking about um, what, did, what was our goal? Why did we want to run the CTF other than just the fact that it's fun? Um, we wanted to raise the security and awareness of skills of all of our developers. So understanding that they are developers, maybe our front-end developers have never even thought about a buffer overflow, for instance. Um, we wanted to just sort of raise their awareness of, of, of the different kinds of ways that uh, security vulnerabilities present themselves. Um, we also wanted to engage a broad audience. So again, most of our employees are not hackers, and especially the employees that aren't in our development team. Um, so we, were, we wanted to, to engage our marketing teams, our sales teams, um, our customer support teams. Uh, we wanted them to just think about security a little bit um, to the degree that they can. Um, and we, we needed to measure our impact. So when, when we came to the end of it, we wanted to know like um, that we weren't just playing a game and wasting company time. Um, so we started with thinking about our communications. How are we going to communicate this with the company? So we started planning in October. Um, Hacktober is a thing in many companies. Uh, it's starting to become a bigger thing in kind of the industry uh, as a whole. Um, so we decided October was a good time. Um, so we started planning for it in August, uh, which gave us a few months of lead time to come up with challenges, come up with our communications plan. Uh, we engaged our internal events group. So we have a group that um, they organize like a, a, any kind of uh, internal event that we're doing. So any company announcement kind of things. Uh, we engaged our communications department to give us like the right way to phrase things and where we should put things, which Slack channels we should go in, uh, should we put up posters, that kind of thing. Um, uh, we organized uh, a live lock picking village because we have a, a few lock sport enthusiasts that, that work uh, both on and off the security team, so we put together that um, just to give people something they could come in and you know talk to the security team, play with lockpicks. It's always fun. Uh, we organize, we put together channels because we're Slack for CTF organizers, CTF participants, office hours. So you know if you were struggling with a challenge, you could come in and talk to us, and we could give you hints. Uh, and we also wanted to avoid disruption, so we thought about the length of time for the challenges to run. Um, and most CTFs will run for uh, a weekend, um, thinking that you know we don't want to drag people in their off hours. We want we didn't want to run it on a weekend. They also have other work to do, so we didn't want to run it in the middle of the workday. So we we gave it a, a week, um, and then we started thinking about prizes. Uh, like what are we going to give out? Uh, so we had issues with, for instance, lock picks. Uh, we have we're a multi, we're an international company. Some of the rules in some jurisdictions are kind of fuzzy. We don't really want to ship lock picks across international lines where they may be prohibited. Um, so we had to think about what we were going to do for prizes. Um, so when we came up with our challenges, uh, we, we thought about what's in a regular CTF. And it's usually crypto challenges, forensics challenges, et cetera, um, and web app challenges, et cetera. Um, but we also wanted to engage the non-security people, so we brought in some security trivia, we brought in some OSINT challenges, um, and some Slack-specific challenges, us being Slack. We wanted people to think about what is it like to uh, uh, administer a Slack team um, securely. Um, so when we came up, when we started to put together the infrastructure, we chose uh, Facebook CTF. Um, we did that because of the visual effects. We thought it would just be a really stunning way for a, a company to come in and uh, start clicking around on things and get cool animations and et cetera. Um, CTFD is a wonderful platform. 
Uh, it's not very visually stunning. We have many develop or we have many designers and f front end engineers that you know we wanted to give them something of like this is actually an interesting platform to use. Um, we bought a domain fidgetspinning.life because memes. I don't know. We're a bunch of millennials, um, and we offer we also have some uh, accessibility concerns. So we have several developers that have. Uh, uh, hearing and, and visual uh, impairments. Um, so we put together a spreadsheet that had the challenges on it so that uh, it was more useful for screen readers and stuff. Uh, we put it on DigitalOcean. We used Slack for collaboration uh, because we're Slack. Uh, and we came up with a slogan that is a play on the company slogan, which is Slack is where CTFs happen. Uh, and I'll hand it over to Max to talk about our flags. Also, quick poll: How many people are doing the CTF here this this these days? Okay, how many people have done a CTF ever? Okay, cool. Yeah, so so you're at a security conference. You've probably done one, but uh, yeah, we wanted flags that catered to all sorts of of people: people who had never done a CTF, people who had never heard of a CTF, and also people who maybe had dabbled or who had experience. So we had to have a a broad range of, of flags to offer to our um, employees. So when we were setting up, um, we split the work between uh, a handful of our teams. So we had ProdSec working on the web app challenges. So we worked with John on some of the crypto challenges, and we made harder challenges as well. We had our incident response team work on forensics challenges. Um, and we had everyone kind of collaborate on the miscellaneous challenges or trivia. We wanted security trivia questions that would inform or educate people, even if you could just Google the answer. Well, everything you could Google the answer for trivia. But it was designed to uh, get people thinking about security topics or pop culture. Um, so our flag names, uh, we tried to keep them meme-based, appeal to um, avocado toast eating demographics. Uh, we had a lot of puns. Um, and yes, we split the work between the relevant teams. So our first handful of questions were in kind of, we called them trivia and sleuthing. So we had, uh, if you want to cry, my lover was one of them. And this referred to uh, Marcus Hutchins being indicted under this Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, if you didn't work in security, maybe you hadn't heard about that or want to cry. So we wanted people to um, get a feel for what goes on in the security world. Um, All your base are belong to us was an intro to base64 encoding. So not, not um, super dense security, but things that you could Google for and start to see like, um, we wanted to show a path as we went through the harder challenges. So start with stuff that was simple and, and show people bit by bit like how they could reach uh, harder security topics. Also, yeah, so through in security pop culture, we had OS int and Slack specific challenges. So these were also meant to be able to be Googled. So we had a flag on LinkedIn, we had a flag on Instagram, just to kind of show people, if you're not thinking about it, how social media, how um, the internet can have this information sitting around there and how easy it is to actually find. We had a few challenges within Slack, within like slash command configurations and other things to get people poking around and seeing like, oh, this is, this is what you work on. Where can things be hidden here? How do you administer it securely? And this, um, we highly recommend this if you're, if you're building your own, if you're working on one at your own company, like the things you're working on, people know very well and it's a good way for them to engage in puzzles, but puzzles of the product that they know or um, to show, um, to give people who maybe aren't actually building it, but the people who work in it a chance to shine. Um, so another one was, it's all Latin to me. This was a simple ROT13 and kind of then an intro to Caesar ciphers. Uh, hash me outside, how about that, which was more topical at the time, if anyone remembers that, was uh, about MD5. This was to show the ease of, of breaking MD5. Um, we had a couple MD5 hashes, and you could use hash killer to get them back to the flag, which is, was uh, Dr. Phil, I think. Um, we also had uh, forensics challenges. So our incident response team put together a PCAP of, uh, of an attack scenario, so of an insider threat who was sending information outside of Slack. And the goals, was, the goals were to see what information was sent out and also to dabble in Wireshark or whatever tool you wanted. We recommended Wireshark. But to get people who maybe, maybe are technical but haven't done traffic analysis before to start looking at that or to get people 
looking at um, these traffic captures to do some like unzipping of files, uh, traffic analysis, dot doc properties, exif. So if you haven't seen a JPEG with location data before, then this was a time for you to be able to find that out. Um, we had some puns and hints in there as well. Um, it's worth noting, so if you've done a CTF that has forensics challenges before those, you, you, I think the ones I've seen usually start with strings or um, looking through the raw files as the easiest part and then they get significantly harder. We wanted to have a much less technically demanding way of um, showing like critical thinking through a scenario without needing to know necessarily the tools or file types and formats or how you would break passwords or vulnerable versions of whatever software. So um, we then had um, a range of web application flags. So this is not forensics, this is web app. Um, so the ProTSec team and Red team worked on web application flags ranging from HTML comments at the, the easiest. So go to a page and in the comment is a flag. Um, to PHP deserialization vulnerabilities, that was much harder. We tried to cover uh, the OWASP top 10, and we had an XX, XSS uh, exploitation where we ran PhantomJS to actually require people to exploit this to receive the flag. So they had to um, um, they had to steal like document.cookie and then send it to a site and we would actually send off the, we had PhantomJS running so that we would send the cookie over to whatever site they chose and that had the flag in it. So in addition to, so it was beyond just doing an alert box, it was actual exploitation of XSS. Um, we also had SQL injection, RCE via OS command injection, PHP deserialization as I mentioned, and LFI. Um, which we added during the competition. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about the execution and the uh, on the fly or just in time nature of some of the flags that we made. So as John mentioned, to start this off, we had company-wide announcements, preparation. We coordinated with our internal events team. We launched early for the Melbourne office uh, because they are um, in the future from San Francisco. So on uh, Sunday, we set things up to so that Melbourne could start doing it from the get-go. Um, by the end of day one, one team of five people had done most of the challenges. And so we were happy to see that um, people were working on it, people were forming teams and working together with um, people in their office, people on their team, um, but not just their immediate coworkers. And then we ran out of challenges. Uh, so a couple of our stronger teams, which is our, uh, our CTO and co-founder, uh, and a guy who used to work in, used to be a hacker and then moved to ops. Uh, they both did everything. And then we had two people who are twins in Vancouver uh, who work in front end, but also crushed all of these. So then we were scrambling to make slash borrow more challenges. So um, that PHP deserialization, for example, and some harder crypto challenges, um, a padding oracle challenge that we made. Those were all done the week of once uh, people finished all the challenges we realized uh, we, need to, we need to make this harder. So uh, what worked? People participated. We had teams for in Melbourne and Vancouver and San Francisco, uh, a couple people in New York. We had people in Dublin. Um, so all over the company, people participated of, across diverse departments, not just engineering. Uh, there were, we, the security team had a, uh, more interactions with these teams, more conversations with people outside of what we would normally have where maybe it's just a security question. We now had people saying, hey, how do we do this challenge? Or hey, can you give us hints? Uh, this was, I think, the it was the most we've talked with our CTO before. Yeah, I, I had never <laughs> spoken to our CTO before the CTF uh, when he came up to ask me about one of the challenges that I stole from Plaid. <laughs> yeah, so uh, so we had, uh, we had we boosted our security interaction and, and kind of presence within the company. Um, people complimented some of the challenges. We saw um, teams formed. Uh, the majority of people who did this were on the team. Out of our top 10 teams, about half, or sorry, top 10 uh, ranked groups, which could have been an individual, half of them were teams. So the top four people were individuals, and then after that it was mostly teams. So we were pretty happy with that, to see people engaging and working together. Um, we also got security cookies at the end. Um, so uh, we gave these out at the closing event. 
Um, other things that worked. For the most part, the servers stayed up. We had about five eights, and so that's a B plus. Uh, Facebook CTF is flashy and fun. It's, uh, if you haven't, oh, who has used CTFD before? Who has used Facebook CTF before? Um, so CTFD is pretty straightforward. Facebook CTF, you click through like various countries of the world and it looks very hackery and uh, matrix-esque. So it was a, it was a pretty fun uh, way to do it. We had four individuals who completed all of our challenges, including the last minute ones that we made. Uh, we had uh, an unfurl link in Slack, so if you shared the link uh, to any of the fidgetspinning.life domains, it would unfurl um, with that cool hacker. We had uh, trophies and prizes, so uh, we gave certificates and trophies to the top uh, 10 finishers, and for a handful of people, we gave Raspberry Pis and a couple other bits of hardware, so um, yeah, we had a, with not a huge budget, we were able to give out pretty neat prizes and have people engaged and having fun. A um, couple things that didn't work. Facebook CTF sometimes had some uh, hip hop VM caching issues that um, made like changing the code very difficult to uh, figure out how to actually get the changes to show up. Um, and also the interface of that makes it kind of hard to pull challenges in a list and go from easier to hardest because you're clicking through countries but there's not a, an obvious like, oh, this is 25 points, this is 50 points, this is 100 points. So it's um, at the expense of a little bit of usability, it looks cooler. Um, I'm not a sysadmin, there was a lot of copying and pasting scripts um, and then I think every time uh, server messed up, I would just burn it down and start it over um, because we didn't do any chefing or anything. So uh, there are occasional flubs of challenges in the haste to make the new ones. So the padding oracle one, for example, um, forgot that you can't get the first block of ciphertext, but the second half was Googleable, so people were still able to get it. Um, DigitalOcean uh, probably has more features that we could utilize. Um, there were a lot of manual fixes, manually adding SSH keys. So there are um, a couple, a couple things that, like, in the haste to make new challenges, or in the um, lack of us doing um, uh, infrastructure management, were a little more difficult. Um, pleasant surprises. So we had a higher than expected level of participation, good engagement, good discussions. We had a Slack channel for the discussions. Um, as we said, attention from higher levels. We had engagement from ICs to execs. Um, we had security enthusiasm from the top down and that was great. Less pleasant, we had really smart people doing it, so we ran out of challenges. Um, it's probably like a teeny bit of lost productivity from the people who were doing this and from us That's who, uh, lost productivity yeah, so we lost, we lost a week of, uh, <laughs> of, of work, but Slack stayed secure in the meantime. Don't, <laughs> don't worry about that. Um, and so I'm gonna hand it back over to John to talk about some of the lessons learned. So uh, we, at the end of the CTF, we asked for feedback. Um, so we put together a poly, did we use poly or, I don't know. We put together a, a survey um, on, uh, on the CTF that we handed out afterwards to get some engagement, and some more like answers. Um, some of the questions were, what, what were people's favorite challenges? What were their least favorite challenges? Um, people really liked the, the SQL uh, injection one, um, a couple of, the, the, a couple of the top finishers that finished everything uh, really enjoyed this one challenge that I stole from Plaid. It was uh, a Python REPL, sorry, it was a, a server you connect to, you get a Python REPL, but you don't get the standard library or alphanumeric characters. Um, so that, that one was uh, interesting. Um, people's least favorite challenges were the cross-site scripting ones, um, the padding oracle question, because again, you couldn't get the first block. Um, the XSS one died every so often. Phantom JS would break, so that was why. The rest of it, people liked when it worked. Yeah. Um, some of the positive aspects that we got, as not just from our team, but from the feedback itself, um, people really liked the collaboration of it. Um, they enjoyed being able to form teams. Um, they, t they, they liked coming into security office hours, talking to us about them, getting hints. Um, they also enjoy the education challenges. So there's, there's a, a sort of rush that you get when you solve, when you hack something for the first time. And, and for most of our developers, they'd never 
actually written a buffer overflow or a, a SQL injection before, and, and getting things that you're not supposed to be able to get from them uh, gives you a rush. So people really enjoyed that from the education aspect, so now they know what cross-site scripting looks like more than just don't write it. Um, some areas that we got that we could improve is better sandboxing. Um, they were all kind of running on one server. Uh, there was no, you know, there wasn't any separation between it. If you managed to mess it up, which happened with one of our stored cross-site script, was it? yeah, one of our stored um, challenges, you could yeah. mess it up for basically everyone, and then the security team had to pull it down and bring it back up again. Um, so, you know, probably segregate it more. Um, and the other thing that we could have improved is, is more PR and more buildup. So we had an announcement in, in, our, in our announcement, like a global announcement channel um, that we're running the CTF. I think it was like a week beforehand and then the start of. Um, so a lot of people had projects that they were working on, like actual work projects that they were working on um, and would have loved to compete in the CTF, but they had all of, the, uh, all, all of their actual like OKRs for work to do instead that week. Um, had we announced it beforehand, people could have planned around it. Uh, so had we announced it more beforehand, um, people could have planned around it. Um, so some of the lessons we learned is have a cool domain name because it's fun. We were thinking tidepods.life next, uh, but that might be a little bit dated next October. <laughs> uh, and again, market it better ahead, again, uh, ahead of time. Um, uh, and the other thing to, to note is don't underestimate people. We assumed that uh, ha not being hackers and not being CTF players, most of our developers would have a really hard time with the challenges. Um, but again, like by day one, we had to start coming up with more and more difficult challenges because as it turns out, they do actually know how to do this. They're smart people, that's why they work there. Um, and it would be good to incorporate even more teams. So we had some of the, um, we had some of the challenges that were accessible to everyone, so the, the <coughs> trivia and sleuthing type challenges. Um, it would be nice to have both more of those more diverse challenges that were not technical um, and, and maybe score them separately in some scheme that we haven't figured out yet. Um, just so that the, the you know, I'm, I'm not trying to pick on marketing here. Um, just so that the marketing person, for instance, that's playing the CTF can win a prize. They can actually win the CTF by doing those challenges and not have to worry too much about the like super hard, you need to know how to write code challenges. Um, some future work. Uh, we're running one, we're, we're already planning the one to run next October. Um, August to October turned out to be a very short amount of time when you have other work to do. Um, so we're, we're starting to plan it now. Um, one of our members of our compliance team is really interested in, in, in helping, so she's going to help us uh, with a lot of the legwork on that one um, so we can focus more on the challenges. Um, more, ter more participation would be nice. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, we didn't, we didn't announce it with enough run-up for people to be able to like plan their quarterly projects around, you know, there will be a week where you do less work. Um, uh, more communication, again, same reason. Uh, and, and again, like I mentioned, tiers and prizes for different levels. So have your non-technical staff scored differently from your technical staff. Maybe do it by department. Um, haven't figured out exactly how we want to do that, but it, it would be good to recognize that the smart people that are in your non-technical positions um, should have a shot of winning. Um, and I think that's all we've got. Uh, we have some time for Q&A. Uh, oh yes, we did, we did publish the solutions afterwards. Um, we had a... There was a, a, a wrap-up meeting, um, which was unfortunately not recorded. Um, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, we had a, we had a, uh, the question if you didn't hear was did you publish the solutions after? We did publish them and we did a, a like hour-long rundown for the company going through each challenge and how to do it, including different ways that you could have done it based on um, some people solved the challenges in ways that we didn't originally intend, so we tried to cover every way that you could have come to the conclusion. Next yes. question uh, comes from me. Uh, how many people have been involved in the preparation? Um, so in the first one, the number, okay, people involved in the preparation. So making the challenges was you, me, Eric, Michael, Vickery. <laughs> yeah, I think that, that was 
So, so like five, I think, people <laughs> made the challenges. And then we, we had more people involved um, from different teams doing um, promotion. And so like Ali, the head of our incident response team, was um, super involved in um, getting like the prizes and helping set up like prizes, cookies, all this other stuff. We had um, facilities team. We had some other people doing lock pickings. Um, but the main challenges and running of the infrastructure was about five of us. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And also going forward, we are now going to have more people. Our team has, has grown a lot and we're uh, planning a bit farther ahead. So we're gonna have more involvement from more teams. Um, and also, yeah, like John said, uh, loop in more teams, get more diverse challenges. Also hopefully, um, yeah, we have, it's a big company with a broad set of skills. So we have people who can help us like run things more smoothly and also judge the level of difficulty. So yeah, we can, we can actually engage the operations team to do our operations. Uh, because that's not our job and we're bad at it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, not, not that we, yeah, not that it's their job, I guess, but I've, I've definitely felt out of my element in running some of those things and there are, there are people on the team who excel at that and their advice would uh, get us to like five nines maybe, like an A, A plus, yeah. Okay, so uh, beside the, Besides the general security knowledge in the company and uh, integration and so on, have you found it useful for developers? You see now less security bugs? So um, we are getting better at tracking our security bugs. The, the, there are a lot of different factors going into it that unfortunately makes it a bit hard to track if like our bugs have gone down. So anecdotally, um, I think we've had more conversations and um, engaged with more people, or more people now reach out and, and DM and say like, hey, I have a security question. And maybe it was a person that I had first interacted with during the CTF. But now um, we've had more conversations with them after the fact. As far as fewer vulnerabilities, it's, it's hard to say because our company has also, I don't know if we've doubled in the last year, but we've added like several hundred people. So like we have, we have more and more features. So I think the people who participated know a little bit more about the security aspects, but we also have more features, so more bugs, but then the security team has gotten bigger too. So we're doing more like to prevent stuff. So it's, um, we're trying to get better at like granular tracking of it. I couldn't say for sure that we have fewer bugs. I could say for sure that we've had more conversations and um, more, people who have like referenced the CTF or um, brought it up after the fact. So it's, at the very least, it has stayed in some people's minds. So I would say it's a strict improvement, but I don't know how much. Do you plan to do this on a more regular basis, not only annually? Um, that's a good question. I think if we had the resources, we would run this. We had a lot of good feedback and people who really liked it. I think. Um, it was, um, we were such a small team putting it together that the prospect of doing it more than once a year seemed hard, but our team has grown a lot now. So I think um, we would like to get to a point where we do it more than once a year, or maybe we have like some other challenges to get people kind of involved and like excited, having fun um, as a way to um, bolster our current security training. And also, what would be cool, like sort of longer term goal, would be to run one publicly. Um, so have people outside of Slack who can participate, have, um, have that as a means of like boosting our interaction with the security community, probably also recruiting, but also like giving out prizes and um, just interacting more and getting better at running CTFs for our own training, but also giving back more to the community. So yes, uh, our, our plan is to do this more when we will, I'm not totally sure yet, but um, doing it again in October and doing it bigger is our first, uh, first step on the process to doing it more frequently internally and then hopefully externally or like open sourcing some challenges, et cetera. Um, do you guys plan in releasing those uh, challenges publicly? So yes, sort of. So some of the challenges are our hiring challenges. Um, so we use them as a as like part of the coding interview for for product security. At least there are things. Uh, some of our challenges say like hack this vulnerable website and provide a write up. So we don't want to give those literal challenges out in case it completely removes the um, effectiveness of our of our hiring. 
But um, there are challenges in there that were just for fun, and there are some things that are more Slack specific. So yes, with the caveat that we need to balance it with like how to keep hiring or interviewing people without uh, everyone being able to copy and paste the answers. And, and to be clear, some of them are open source because I stole them. <laughs> that too, yeah. So, so there, there are a few of these that were already on the internet. Um, but so yes, and that's um, as we as we get more mature, we're hoping to, and that would also go along well with um, running a public one. So if we could run a public CTF and then after the fact open source the the challenges and let people use it, um, that is uh, one of our like big bigger goals. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you, everyone, and thank you again, um, John and Max from Slack. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.